Are they sirens in New York, Jeanette? Yeah, can you hear them? Yeah, it's really loud, yeah. Yeah, I know, sorry about that, but I, I live on... Um, yeah. Just the seagulls. Seagulls, so that's nice. I love that. Yeah. No, I miss Brighton, actually. Brighton is cool. Yeah, it's nice. It is, it really is. Good fish and chips, that's what I remember. Well, I had a boyfriend that came from New Haven. Oh, right, okay, yeah. Yeah, you know, one year, one summer, we painted the Seaford seafront railings. It was because his uncle had the contract and it was my job to run up and down the railings all summer with paint pots on my bicycle. <laughs> so it was great. I mean, it was just such a perfect English summer, you know, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. the lunchtime, you know, drinks at the pub. It was so great. I like that coast. It's really nice. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Really good. Now you've been a uh, reading the book was just like putting me down a road down memory lane <laughs> last night. It was interesting. Then uh, it's so good. Who knows, there might be a demonstration walking by here while we're on the, uh, I mean, this is so crazy because I'm right near Washington Square. So there's like stuff. You know. They do a demonstrations every day. Yeah, oh, at least one. Yeah. yeah. Usually, and on the weekend, two or three, and sometimes they all join together. And they've got it really organized now. Mm. It's interesting. They have, um, did you see that they took the statue down in Bristol? You know, the... Yeah, did they? Yeah, that's right. What are you guys saying? I don't know why. They said that, oh, it had been put up against the council's permission or something. Oh, they took the new statue down. They took the new statue down. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I didn't see that. I pretty much look at the Guardian every morning, by the way, so I keep up with that stuff. But, wow, that's... Um, they took it down. Mm. And of course, if that was here, that would have caused a riot. Probably. But yeah, I, I haven't checked you since. Something might have kicked off, but yeah. Yeah. So they didn't have permission. Well, they probably didn't have permission to take it down either. <laughs> so, I mean... I think this might be a good time to go ahead and get started. Okay. <laughs> First, just one, just... Perfect. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you're uh, uh, coming to us from. Um, my name is Jeremy Glover. I've been interned with the University of Michigan Press this summer. Um, we are delighted to present uh, Mimi Hatton in conversation with Janet uh, Beckman for Mimi Hatton's most recent book, uh, What is Post Punk? Just some uh, webinar features to keep in mind. Um, audio and video will be muted for all attendees. Um, reading hosts, aka okay, panels, will be shown on the screen, but no one else. Um, Q&A and chat are both enabled, and we encourage you to make use of those as the talk goes on. Um, and if you have any technical issues, please let us know in chat. So you'll use chat for discussion. Um, to open the chat window, you'll click on the chat button at the bottom of the application. It'll be the, I think, second or third option um, in that bottom row for you. Um, by clicking the dot to dot button in the chat, pop up and you'll select two options to be able to chat with. You can either send questions directly to the panelists and attendees, or you can send it to um, just the panelists. And then you'll use Q&A to ask questions to the panelists directly. Um, open the Q&A window, you'll click the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom application. Um, and it's an anonymous question, you'll type your question in the box and click the send anonymously button. University of Michigan Press um, series takes place on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Um, in June and August of this uh, summer. Um, connect, connect with University of Michigan Press authors and learn about their books and interact live. 
Um, you can also learn about the University of Michigan's Christ ebook collection um, on Fulcrum, which is free to read till August 31st. Um, and public participation chat encouraged, recordings available. We'll be, just to clarify, we'll be recording this session um, and polls will be coming shortly. Right, so our first poll um, is what is your primary goal? It'll uh, pop up for you in just a few moments. And you can read along on Fulcrum and of course follow us on social media. I'll post the non umich um, link in the chat in just a few moments. This poll is over. So here's just a few details about the University of Michigan Press. Um, founded in 1930, it's been part of the University of Michigan Library System since 2009. Um, publishes around uh, publishes around 100 uh, new books a year. And about 5,000 plus titles have published to date. Um, some of our key strengths include political science, performing arts, classics and archaeology, American studies, um, Af African studies, and Asian studies and also English language learning and small trade lists, mainly about the US Great Lake, Lakes, the region. Um, we have a strong commitment to digital scholarship, including open access, um, hence our emphasis on having the uh, ebook available in our chat. All books featured in the author live talk series are part of the University of Michigan Press ebook collection. Um, UMP EBC is accessed via Fulcrum, an open source community development platform built by the University of Michigan, which supports new platforms of humanities scholarship. Fulcrum offers digital enhancements such as 3D models, um, embedded audio, video, databases, zoomable online images, and interactive media. Uh, and of course, read and download open access titles. Um, UMP UBC is available to libraries via uh, Library Sys. Okay. Without further ado, um, what is post punk gender and identity in the Bonkart popular music by Mimi Haddon? Um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to our panelists. Thank you, for, uh, thank you for joining us and thank you all for being here. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Hi, everyone. So um, I think the way this is going to work loosely is that Jeanette's going to ask me some general questions and then we're just going to have a chat, I think. Sounds about right. Yeah. Good. Well, um, I guess let's begin. I mean, I guess my big question to you is my first question because I don't know if you guys, if, you know, people know that I photographed a lot of bands back in the day. I used to work for Melzi Maker from 1976 to 82. So I, my, my question to you is, um, what is the book about and what is your fascination with this era? Um, okay, so the, so. Right. I'm just gonna try and close this <laughs> Crazy noise. It's New York, you know.
Um, so, are you there, Jeanette? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm here, sorry, I just want to close the window because they're taking down the hoardings across the street. So. Okay. I see. Go ahead. Um, okay, so the book is about post-punk and it's also about genre. So what I'm doing is I'm using post-punk to think about genre in popular music. Um, I'm not doing the classifying, so I'm not the one who's saying this is post-punk, this is new wave, this is punk. I'm actually reading the music press discourse of the late 70s, early 80s, and kind of feeling around the borders of like, wait, why is that punk? And why is that post-punk? Excuse me, and why is that new wave? So it's not a kind of like, it's not a book that says this qualifies as post-punk because it's a book that says, oh, this is considered post-punk. Why is that? But also, what are the stakes of that? So, um, yeah, so the kind, of, the kind of artists that I cover in the book are bands like Joy Division, The Raincoats, Per Ubu, um, PIL. Um, it's not a comprehensive tour through every single band from that era. It's, yeah, it's very much about the stakes of categorization and classification, yeah. Um, and my attraction to the topic, um, I guess I've got three answers to that. So the first one is that um, I grew up in the north of England. I'm from an ex-mining town, uh, kind of between Sheffield and Doncaster very post Thatcher, very de-industrial, very bleak, very, very white, and very working class. Um, and when I first heard a band like Joy Division, I was probably about 15, I was like, oh yeah, that's it. Like, that's the sound. That's the sound that I'm kind of looking for, and that's the sound that has some kind of meaning for me. Now that I'm kind of like an academic, I'm able to kind of unpick that and say, okay, and kind of problematize that and, you know, kind of sound really represent a particular place. But at the time, being 15, uh, hearing Joy Division, I was like, oh yeah, that's, you know, cause that's the kind of, it kind of spoke to me, I suppose. Um, my second answer to that question is when I did my PhD and I moved to Montreal, so I moved from England to Montreal in 2009. I lived there for six years. And a friend that I met there gave me a CDR of um, The Only Fun in Town, which is a Joseph K record from about 1981. And I was like, oh yeah, this is that music again that's kind of dark, but groovy. Um, and then my third answer is a bit more academic. I guess it's more, I'm really interested in kind of I'm really interested in classification but I'm also interested in processes of like what I call um kind of absorption and disavowal in popular music but maybe I can make that a little bit more kind of like audience friendly and to say like why is something cool one minute and it's not cool the next right and why does do some things get to be cool and other things aren't cool so yeah so that's kind of they're the three reasons maybe or my kind of three entry points into this particular period yeah yeah it's very interesting i was actually just watching a movie last night about this pakistani kid who finally i don't know if you guys have seen i forget the name of it um who finds his joy division in bruce springsteen at school he's a misfit have you guys seen that movie it's actually really great because you know he's in a depressed you know racist sort of community and he he's suddenly someone introduces gives him a uh springsteen take and i guess the lyrics really say exactly what he's thinking because there's springsteen growing up in jersey in asbury park and it's the same thing you know and it's dark it's really dark mm -hmm. and i think you know it's interesting that you say it was that the music is dark because it was a very dark time post-punk I mean, I, I don't know. I've been thinking about it a little bit, obviously, so I've been reading your book, but I mean, it's almost as if the punk movement, you know, which would be bands more like The Clash, you know, early punk bands, 
sort of over, you know, and obviously the Sex Pistols. It's almost like they overthrew, overthrew society and rules and, you know, the class system and everything. I mean, there was this huge revolution because I remember, I mean, I can only speak from where I, I walked into sound. There were, well, there were four music papers when I started, Sounds, Melody Maker, Enemy, and Record Mirror. And I walked into Sounds one day, I'd never photographed the band before. And this woman, Vivian Goldman, who you guys also should know about because she was the punk professor at NYU, adjunct, um, gave me a job that day to go and photograph Susie and the Banshees. And I had no idea how to do it, but I did it. And you know, <laughs> It was a very dark time because obviously Thatcherism, just what you were describing, you know, and the systems that had been in place and, you know, Americans don't quite, are never going to quite understand the class system, am I right, that we had to deal with when you talk about coming from a, you know, a town up north like you did. It was you know, a very different life from if you were Lord such and such's son, you know what I mean? Mm. The class system and obviously the economic system. So I guess where I'm going with this is the revolution had sort of taken place during punk. It was like they had the guillotine out. They decapitated everybody, you know. Johnny Rotten had said fuck on TV and that was like a huge thing on a chat show. You know, the Sex Pistols said the F word. It it was it on every newspaper headline. And it kind of changed everything in a way. It just allowed all of this discourse to happen. And then after a bit, you know, everybody was running around in their ripped up jeans and their, you know, crazy hair and bands. You'd go to concerts, people were spitting and this and that and the other. And then I guess we got tired of it. And I think that's where post-punk, it's almost like the revolution happened. And then there had to be something new. It allowed something new to come in, which I don't know, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think what's really interesting to talk, talking to you, Jeanette, is that like, I grew up in the wake of all that and you grew up through it, you know? So we have these really two different kind of perspectives on it. And I suppose what's interesting is to speak to someone who has a kind of like, almost like a kind of grassroots connection, like yourself with the movement, compared to someone like me who is much younger and doing a kind of retroactive looking at that period in time. Yeah. So that kind of darkness that you refer to, I can feel through my upbringing and I can hear in the music, but I didn't live through it. Maybe we could think of it that way. Yeah. I think, you know, British society, you know, we have Kings and Queens and, super wealthy people and you know you're born in you're born i think in england you know you're born into a, you're born into the upper class the middle class or the working class and they kind of want you to stay there am i right mimi in a way or they used to it's better now i think i think they're shocked when you kind of move between classes yeah yeah and I think that's what a lot of punk was about mm. because, you know, working class kids, and it was a lot of kids from art school as well. And, you know, those art school kids definitely, you know, I mean, I was an art, art school kid. So I think, you know, the post-punk bands that you're talking about, you know, like Echo and the Bunny Man and Adam and the Ants, you know, they came from a more intellectual art school background than a lot of the, the raw punks in a way. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and that's definitely something that I pick up on in the book. Um, I think this kind of aura of sophistication, this kind of edge of sophistication over punk. There's also some really cool work about this coming out, like Gavin Bott um, is writing a book about the Leeds scene. Wow. Um, yeah, and uh, I think somebody called Simon Strange, I think, is writing about post-punk in the context of the art schools as well. But yeah, um, that kind of sort of eruditeness or the artiness is perhaps something that gives kind of post-punk its identity versus punk. 
again, I'm not the one making these classifications, I'm kind of analyzing the classifications. I mean, an example of this would be something that I write about in the book is um, this kind of, uh, I don't know, let's call it a conversation between uh, John Savage at Sounds and I think Chaz Diwali also at Sounds. They have this two part special, I think in spring of 1978 about this new genre, power pop, right? So like punk is finished and now everything's power pop. But it's quite interesting to read them, try and figure out what power pop is. It's like, okay, is power pop, is that like the Ramones? Cause it's just like powerful and really short songs. Or is power pop actually the artier stuff like Per Ubu and Devo? And it's these conversations about like, art versus accessibility, I think, that have kind of laid the groundwork for this emergence of, I guess, what we'd call punk versus post-punk. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, both of those bands you mentioned, they're from America. Mm -hmm. And I think when the American bands, I mean, the first time I saw the Ramones and Hammersmith Odeon, it was a mind-blowing experience because it's almost like, well, they were on speed because they were, you know, twice as loud, twice as fast, the songs were really short. It was, it just blew everybody away. And I think, you know, the drugs that the bands were taking were very different. And Do you remember they, what year that was, Jeanette? I'm sorry? Do you remember what year that was? Uh, I can look it up. It was probably like 79 or something, right around there. I mean, <clears throat> I think, you know, the American bands were fueled by different drugs and also different society. I mean, because in England, it was like, I mean, as far as the drugs go, you know, there were people who smoked pot and there were people that took speed. And <laughs> that was, you know, the mods took speed. I remember being in, a, in the airport in Paris with my friend Paolo Hewitt, who you probably know, a writer. And, we used to work together a lot. And we got in this huge argument about what was better, speed or weed. And, and we missed our flight. It was the last flight out. We were so passionate about it. I mean, I was the pothead and the next, you know, art student. And it was really important. That kind of drug thing seemed to separate people and, you know, make different music in a way. You can hear it from, you know, Weller and the Jam and that real speedy, passionate, thing, you know, as opposed to, you know, a Clash song where, you know, reggae, and we have to also remember that we had a lot of Afro-Caribbean people in London and mm -hmm. reggae was huge. And I think that reggae really shaped, it shaped the British music scene from, you know, from Clash to Echo, really. All of it. Yeah. That dub yeah. thing is huge rather than, you know, I mean, we always look to America in the beginning, like the Rolling Stones and Beatles. You know, if you read Keith Richards' bio, you know, he idolized Muddy Waters. We, we love American black music and disco, by the way. But we were, you know, in England, we had reggae. Yeah. Yeah, which I think is something that kind of, uh, it's certainly something that I write about in the book. Chapter two is about the kind of post-punk relationship to dub reggae, but also the way that the kind of contours of that relationship kind of shape whether something is or isn't post-punk. Um, but I also kind of situate that in the context of a kind of like seeming disavowal of all that black music history. So I've got a quote from Keith Levine, I think, at the beginning of chapter two, where he says, my thing isn't black music. But yeah, then, you know, then we know that PIL, their whole thing was black music. You know, so when he says black music, what is he talking about? Is he talking about Muddy Waters, Robert Johnson? Is he talking about the Rolling Stones as black music? Or is he talking about, you know, Kwesi Johnson or Augustus Pablo or... <clears throat> Right. I, I was shocked when I read that. I read that last night it's like, because Hill was all about dub. Johnny Rotten, huge dub fan. And you can hear it. I mean, if it wasn't for dub, it wouldn't be Hill. So, and Joe Wobble, you know, led that. 
Yeah. But that yep. was really interesting. I mean, you know, as far as white music, I mean, I think the jam are a lot whiter in a way. It's like a the jam, like a, a white working class band in a way. Mm, mm. And maybe punk was in the beginning, I mean, bef you know, before things like the Clash and the Slits, of course. I don't know, you call Slits post-punk, right? You think? Um, no, I, I mean, I don't know if you want my opinion, they're a punk band, but if in the context of the book, I'm, th I'm thinking about like, you know, so for example, Simon Reynolds was really, really influential book, Rip It Up and Start Again, which is brilliant. It's like an amazing tour through all of these bands. He includes the slits as post-punk. So I suppose I'm asking, okay, so why have they snuck into post-punk and why are they not punk anymore? So I think it, ha you know, I think it has something to do with um, contemporary, that is to say, like today's perception of post-punk being somehow more inclusive than punk, right? So being more inclusive in terms, is post-punk about women? Is it about black music? Is it about difference? Versus punk being quite narrow? At the time, all of these bands, all of these genres were mixed in together, right? You know, these clear distinctions between punk, new wave and post-punk didn't really exist. But what's interesting is retroactively the way that they've been kind of siphoned off into different genres by fans, by, you know, by journalists. I mean, it's really interesting, you know, to talk to my students. A lot of them play kind of punk style music. And I say, how would you describe their music? They go with post-punk. I'm like, you're not punk? Then, no, post-punk. So it means something. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, you know, during the maybe punk era, there were so many different genres of music because yeah. Britain, you know, we had a lot of immigrants and people, you know, for a start, we had our eye on America. So rockabilly was huge. Then there were the mods and the skinheads, of course. Yeah. You know, yeah. but skinhead to a racist and, you know, also dance to reggae. That's what yeah. they dance to, ska. I mean, that's the skinhead music, which doesn't really make any sense. And then, you know, the punks. And then all the two-tone bands, which, you know, I personally was like a huge, even now, specials fan. Mm. And there were so many two-tone bands and, you know, bands like Madness that, you know, they were, it's almost like they, it was, there were so many youth cultures going on, but I think they, they attended each other's concerts. I mean, maybe I wouldn't go to a skinhead concert because I didn't like that music, but you know, I, all the rest of it, I, I would be there in a quick minute, you know, and disco at the same time as loving disco and, you know, black music and, yeah being obsessed with the latest 12 inch to come out of america I and mean, it was interesting because you could your music taste was very specific and your friends were specific so you know for me i worked at melody maker i was the second photographer the first photographer a guy called tommy sheehan lovely guy he was a he loved rock so it was perfect led zeppelin tour in texas off he went and leaving me with, you know, to go on tour with the undertones. Right. How happy am I, you know? <laughs> I mean, I was, and it's interesting, and I have to say something about the style, too, because I was always like a misfit in the Mel, like those music papers that you're reading, Melody Maker was a rock paper. Enemy was a lot more kind of avant-garde and intelligent. Mm -hmm. Melody Maker was really a rock paper, but they had to cover punk because... Yeah. You know, and I used to, you know, go into the meetings. I had my uh, madness t shirt that said, fuck up, let's dance. And, you know, my pajama bottoms and my Converse sneakers. And, you know, they'd go, oh, you forgot to get dressed today. I mean, it was always some comment. And you'd right, be like, right. Fuck off. <laughs> you know, I'm not a student here. You know, fuck you all. And, you know, that was me, my punk state you know I, I never really fit in whereas the rest of the people there were wearing jeans tucked into cowboy boots and you know they were rockers they'd go down the pub we few of us would go off and smoke weed you know it was a there were these different cultures 
And I think when post-punk came in, like the clothing was really important, like clubs mm. like Blitz. Mm. You know, you would go, I mean, you would go out and people would be dressed. I mean, dressed to the nines. It wasn't that messy, just put on a pair of ripped up jeans and some safety pins. It was a completely yeah. different aesthetic. Yeah, and, and I think you write about that in the book. You write something about cardigans or sweaters or oh, something. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this amazing quote about the fall. Um, yeah. I can't remember, I can't remember who it's from. I'm blanking, but um, I think, yeah, the writer says something like, have you ever seen a new waiver wearing a sweater you know so it's like the fall are like you know new and adventurous and intellectual because they've got like you know marky smith's got a cardigan on you know it's like yeah. what? um <laughs> and really nice shirts with button i have a picture of that lead singer from the fall with a really beautiful shirt that's kind of buttoned up to here it's like tight fitting he looks amazing more you know like, well i have to say was always a great dresser but <laughs> You know, and he still is, but you know, it, the clothing was really different for those bands. Mm, they, mm. And the style was really important and you could identify people on the street. Mm -hmm. we, I mean, we weren't using that term post-punk, but you knew who was punk. And, I mean, you knew what youth culture they came from just by what they were wearing. Yeah. They, they didn't yeah, even yeah. need a button to say, you know, what bands they liked. You just knew immediately. Mm -hmm. But I think the post punk, I, mean, I remember going on tour with Echo and the Bunny Man. Uh, it was for a cover story for the Face magazine, and um, we went to Blackpool, I think. And in the van, they were playing this incredible um, mix of American psychedelic music, like bands like The Seeds. And I had never heard of The Seeds before. There's, uh, you know, Seeds, Zombies, whatever. I forget. I think it's called Golden Nuggets. That's what it's called. It's an amazing mix of music. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was obvious that it was psychedelic. And it was obvious that, you know, that was probably, you know, leaning towards the kind of drugs that Echo would take when you listen to their music. They probably, I mean, I'm not making judgment. They probably took acid, all of them. I don't know. And it, this is just... <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah it's interesting because Echo and the Bunny and kind of come into the book at sort of a turning point. So the the reason that the book is so narrow um, is because, well, partly it was practical, just like how can I do this kind of this much discourse analysis, like you know, over a long period of time. So partly it was kind of a practical decision, but also there is a kind of turning point, like after the Future Armor Festival. In, I think it was Leeds in 1979, these other new bands start to come through, like Echo and the Bonnie Man, like The Sound, like U2. And they're, all the rock critics are kind of like, we've gone back to rock. We had punk and then we had this other thing that we couldn't quite identify. And now with Echo and with The Sound, like we've gone back to kind of old fashioned rock. So there's this kind of weird, there's this really interesting kind of resistance on the part of the critics to those bands that are kind of, um, you know, that include people like Echo and the Bonnie Men that are kind of coming out sort of after the summer of 1979, I think it is. It's kind of interesting what a short period punk was in a way. Mm, mm. Really intense punk was a very short period. And then, you, you know, I think Two Tone and everything stretched through, but, and obviously Rockabilly, but, yeah, those bands were popping up, but they definitely were more thoughtful, I would say. Mm -hmm. More just kind of uni-based, right. you know, yeah. art school-based, rather than just kids coming from the street. I mean, I don't know if you ever read Steve Jones's biography. I read it recently. And, you know, it's, it's all about him nicking cars and... <laughs> You know, being a general bad boy and taking drugs and whatever. I mean, it's not somebody who went to college and, you know, studied yeah. English literature, which probably I would think, I don't know, I might be making a generalization, but I would think of a lot more of those post-punk bands just from the writing. Yeah, just from the lyrics, the kinds of, you yeah. know, the kind of cultural capital that they have kind of comes through the lyrics. 
And again, this is something that kind of comes up in the, in the press discourse. It's like, you know, I can't remember which writer it is, but they say, I'm not interested in Susie. I'm not interested in Per Ubu. I'm not interested in Devo. They need to leave their library books at home and just rock out with the rest of us. So it's like cardigan, oh. library books, Marxist theory, going to art school. Um, yeah, they were kind of the, the, the stakes and I suppose they're the things that have kind of gone on to kind of generate this thing that we now call post-punk, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have to tell this little story because uh, one of my best friends who shall remain nameless, but you might know who it is, was going out with Mark from, uh, I see you, from the pop yeah. group. Oh yeah, yeah. At the time. And you know, they were living in a kind of semi squat in Labrook Grove. And she was out and he wrote over her bed in black paint, in your decadence, people are dying. <laughs> it was like in drippy black paint. You know, it was just so inappropriate as he was out there wearing a leather jacket and not yeah. paying any rent. And he, it was, <laughs> you know, but that was kind of, I mean, they were probably reading such and all of this, you know, they're probably, their thoughts were coming from a completely different point. Mm -hmm. And I think there was definitely a turning point there. Mm. Very interesting. Did you get a photo of the, of the black scroll? I wish. <laughs> I painted over it as soon as possible. But it was just so, you know, so insane. I mean, you know. And you know, you know, looking at Jane County, Wayne Jane, you know, she was in transition and, you know, trans is such a, well, I guess the last few years, you know, every speaking to identity, you know, people identify, you have to identify who you are. I was teaching last year. And one of the first things is you have to say who you identify, what you identify as. And, you know, Wayne, Jane was one of the first people I ever met who was transitioning into being a woman. Mm. And of course, Genesis, you want to talk about Genesis P. Arch? What would you classify her? In terms of musical genre? Yes. Like industrial noise? Yeah, throbbing gristle. Mm. But, you know, they were building a whole society. They weren't yeah. just playing. I mean, it, and it was dark. I mean, I went round to that house one time when they were living and I felt like I'd gone into the Manson's house or something. It was really frightening and very, very dark and skulls and kind of that black magic vibe. Mm -hmm. you know? I don't know mm -hmm. if you've ever watched any of those Throbbing Bristle movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I sometimes, you know, the, the darkness, I sort of, I think I tried to argue this in chapter three. Um, not, not quite in, along the same lines as Throbbing Gristle, but I think of that kind of melancholy as a way of dealing with or performing whiteness. Um, uh, in that context, I'm quite influenced by um, uh, the way Richard Dyer writes about white identity as kind of like gothic or death obsessed. Um, so yeah, that's one of the, because, well, yeah, actually the jumping off point for that, if I can give that a bit of context, was the phrase death disco. And again, this idea of like disavowal of like, liking disco, being really into it, but somehow feeling as though um, these kind of punk or post-punk musicians have to kind of disavow those pop connotations or maybe even those black music connotations. So one way to do that is through a kind of melancholy or through this kind of darkness. Um, so yeah, that's one way that I try to explore it in the book, yeah. Interesting. So you're saying that white musicians kind of have an issue with being white. They're trying to deal with their whiteness back in the day by delving into the dark side of life. Is that... No, yeah, not necessarily consciously, but why does it have to be death disco? Do you know what I mean? Like, why does it have to be um, anti-disco? 
like the kind of the negative image of disco, right? Because there's a, I feel like there's a kind of racial connotation there in calling it death disco, you're calling it white disco. Um, and that's the way that I read the connotations of that, of that um, song title. I think maybe if someone, if some people got some questions, I've got those things like popping up under. Yeah, have a look, it's hard for me to read it. Oh. Oh, Adrian probably has something to say right here. What does he say? He has thoughts performing whiteness. Can he, I don't know, how are we going to do this, Adrian? Speak up. Let's see. All right. Adrian, talk. I don't know. Can he, can he actually get on here or how does that work? Oh, here he is. Yay. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Adrian. Hi, Adrian. Oh, guys, I'm loving this discussion. Thank you so much. Um, and you're hitting on some things right at this very moment that I've been thinking about for a long time. <clears throat> uh, with, um, with what you were saying, Mimi, about um, this idea of like performing whiteness. Um, I mean, I think that there's a lot of interesting things to say about that. And I don't think that that's something that's really been talked about um, as much with, it, with regards to music. Um, in some of the research that I've been doing, um, you know, I, I, and I was, I was looking at it from the, 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 um, the idea of like, you know, how Bowie is studying mime and, you know, some of these artists, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that were pulling from sort of German expressionism in mm. their music videos and, you know, so that new wave moment where everyone was going out of their way to paint their faces like really white, mm -hmm. you know, it's like the technology has evolved. You don't really have to do that anymore. So why do it? And, and I was wondering, was there something more to it that they were trying to be, that they were hiding or there was something shameful or some kind of exploration into this idea of almost like hyper whiteness, you know, visually, maybe not necessarily culturally, but more so visually, you know? Mm -hmm. A lot of those, you know, bands that would play at the Blitz, you know, like the Spandau and, um, you know, all of those types of bands, I mean, they were very obsessed with post-World War II because mm -hmm. England had never really gotten over the war. And mm -hmm. they were very obsessed with that style and also with that kind of Nazi aesthetic, you know, yes. the long leather coats, and which is <laughs> frighteningly the most white racist thing that you can really think of. I don't know, you might have a point there, Adrian. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I think it's interesting in the context of Bowie because if you read about um, what he says about, um, you know, young Americans um, and him wanting to kind of make a kind of black music, right? Make soul, disco and funk music. And at the same time, having this anxiety around and being really self-deprecating about what he's made. Oh, I, I, I haven't made, I haven't made proper soul. I've just made like plastic soul or fake soul or white soul. So there's this kind of weird anxiety around wanting to make music that's good and that's funky and that's black, but having to disavow it some way in somehow or like disown it. So I wonder if that drawing from those kind of visual aesthetics is kind of part of that process of disavowal and kind of self-effacement perhaps. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I think it's it, definitely appropriation, would you say, Adrian? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think, it, I mean, I think it's, it's the same thing of like people today, like you love Beyonce, but you can't deal with black culture. Like you can't have it both. Like you gotta, you gotta take it all or, or don't take it at all. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, I think some of those same things were happening even back then, even in like, you know, the Elvis era, if you will, about, um, you know, Elvis was appreciating um, black culture and black rock and roll but, and, and mimicking the movements in many ways, but not necessarily trying to, you know, visually, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't be black, obviously. <laughs> but um, I think, I think some of those things, some of those things kind of like make their way into um, even the dialogue, like you were talking about um, de um, Death Disco. I mean, yeah. Death Disco is basically almost an anagram for, anagram for like disco demolition, you know? And yeah, yeah. the things that came from disco demolition, which were uh, very racist and homophobic notions that white men in particular could not dance, you know, mm -hmm. could or were afraid that their 
their rock identity was going to be stripped away from a culture of people that they didn't understand, you know? Yeah. And, and it finds its way into the sort of language and naming and messaging of like compilations. Like even today, like you have, you know, new wave and punk and post-punk compilations, but they name them in these sort of ways that will attract an eye and an ear, you know? Yeah, I guess it's kind of like the mutant disco thing in kind of early 80s New York, that really right. hybrid. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, the death disco, death to disco thing is interesting. And so this is basically this kind of conversation that we're having. This is very much what chapter three is about. Um, because there's a, uh, one of the reviews of death, death disco, the song, the track by Pill, is allegedly erroneously listed as death to disco, mm. you know, and you know, some, you know, fans, critics got kind of potentially excited about a track that's called death to disco. And then they find out it's called death disco, right? So the kind of the, the fine line between, I guess, PIL's disco homage and the kind of, yeah, the uh, disco demolition event as a, a disco destruction is really interesting to sort of to explore and that kind of yeah that um that line between those two things mm. Mm -hmm. mm. and i think you know at that time just around the pill time i mean disco was also still huge well disco black dance music was huge and obviously you know in the gay clubs and you know it's a very joyous music as opposed to the very dark stuff that was coming out of the UK at the time. I mean. But I think what's interesting about the UK stuff is that it is dance music, right? It's like yeah. protest dance music, like Joy Division, um, a certain ratio, pill to some extent. Uh, and then there's American bands like the B-52s. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all dance music, right? So I think that's also what kind of attracted me to it because it was kind of a way of being white and a way of being punk, but it's also groovy. Mm -hmm. Should we take yeah. some more questions? Is that what that says? Yeah. I'll uh, just read them out as they come in. We have uh, three questions. Um, first is, and I'll read them, uh, I'll read them and then give you time to answer before getting to the, uh, the next one. Um, this first question is a uh, short while ago Mimi had just identified this genre being post-punk as a movement, um, which to the, to the question asker indicates an intentionality behind the term. Um, is this identification of movement at odds with the, the external identification that is genre? Hang on, can I read the question? Yeah. Can I just see if I can copy and paste it into the chat for you? Can you see the questions now? Um, Is there a Q and A? I, I can see the Q and A, mm -hmm. um, but I can't see the one about that you just asked me. Mm -hmm. Oh, here we go. One. Sorry, I'm looking in the chat. I'm looking in the wrong mm -hmm. bit. Sorry, sorry. No problem. Um, I think actually that was just a mistake on my part same movement mm -hmm. um but it's a, but it's a really interesting question um this kind of the different words that we use for classification movement genre style indeed i think the you know the difference between genre and style is a particularly um interesting one movement yeah i definitely agree that it implies some kind of intentionality i think it also implies perhaps a kind of mm, a kind of self-conscious politics that genre I don't think does. Genre is more of a kind of ex post facto or a kind of um, uh, an imposition from outside. Because, you know, when you talk to musicians, 
they, you know, they, they're not interested in genre. They don't say that they participate in any genre. Um, and why would they? It's very much, a, genre is the kind of concept that, you know, fans, critics, and people use as a way to just kind of orient, you know, orientate themselves in, in, in language in the world. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that was just a mistake on my part to, to say movement. Um, I was probably saying it to try and be clear or colloquial. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. And then can you see the uh, list? Uh, yeah, I can see the other one. I'm curious how much MTV contributed to the definition of the genre, given the comment about the importance of fashion. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I don't talk, I don't write about MTV in the book, but I don't know if you know Theo Cataphoris's book, Are We Not New Wave? Um, he's got, I think he's got a whole chapter on MTV in that book, and he deals with it in the context of quote unquote modern signifiers or kind of contemporary signifiers of the modern or, uh, or the here and now. Um, so representations of technology, representations of, um, I think things like kind of a sort of futurist aesthetic, you know, and the way that those things contribute to the definition of new wave. Um, so uh, yeah, I would recommend that, but I don't um, write about much that very much in, in the book. I don't think I write about MTV at all, actually. Um, all right, yeah, are we not new wave? Yeah, are we not new wave? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, another question, post-punk certainly seems like a much more self-conscious term now than it did back in the 70s. Your students, for example, very consciously playing post-punk. Did the original post-punk man's even tend to use this term to describe their music though, or was it invented by journalists for ease of categorization? Uh, the latter, invented by journalists for ease of, ease of categorization, but also just to try to articulate some of the things that we've, that Jeanette and to some extent Adrian and I have been talking about this, a genre that's perhaps has a different fashion to punk, a different kind of maybe intellectual connotation. Um, at the time, you know, and you, as I said with the first question, lots of musicians that, you know, they say we're not anything, we're not punk, we're not post-punk, we're not new wave. And I can, you know, and I can see why musicians do that because, you know, if you're being creative, you don't think in terms of genre necessarily. You don't think, oh, you know, I better, I, I want to consciously participate in this genre. You might think in terms of kind of style signifiers, signifiers, but so it's interesting when, you know, it's interesting when kind of musicians' perceptions of what they're doing rub against critics' perceptions of what they're doing. You know, there's this kind of real tension there. Um, I mean, you know, it'd be nice to be able to say genre is meaningless, we don't need genre categorizations, but yet they mean something to people. Like I was just talking, when Jeanette and I were chatting yesterday, we were talking about Paul Weller, and Jeanette said, oh my God, don't tell Paul Weller that he's like New Wave, because he'll, you know, he'll be really disappointed and really, really pissed <laughs> off. Um, again, I'm not categorizing Paul Weller or the jam as new wave, but there's a stakes in that, right? So as much as musicians don't kind of consciously participate in genre or indeed they kind of resist the whole idea of genre categorization, there is nevertheless a meaning in the terms um, that, which makes it such a kind of fraught and interesting topic. Um, Olga, it's not a big question. You can let that first one go. I hope I answered it. Uh, Linnell, how would you characterize Bad Brain's impact on punk? I think Bad Brain's a uh, really interesting example um, because they're a kind of American band that have this uh, Rasta or kind of participate in this Rasta culture. Um, so they're kind of, you know, a sort of interesting outlier in, um, in the punk scene for being black and for being a punk band that is rasta rather than a uh, reggae band. Um, I think generally Bad Brains are kind of ca categorized more as, um, yeah, punk or maybe even hardcore. Um, well, in I terms of, the, sorry? I said both, definitely. Well, yeah, both, yeah. yeah, I think so, yeah. 
I mean, it's hard when you're an artist and you're making something and then, you know, someone comes along and goes, well, actually you're this. And you're like, yeah. oh, I don't really think I am actually, I'm just doing my art. I mean, the categorization of things is very interesting because, you know, it often comes from outside people, you know, looking at art or music and, <clears throat> you know, making some kind of a decision about what you are, who you, you know, who you came from. I mean, I myself have always struggled with the uh, female gaze. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now, you know, I'm gonna ha I, I, I don't really have a choice but to accept it. But right. It's interesting because, I don't know, I mean, do you think Spandau or a band like, you know, some of those bands would categorize themselves now as post-punk? I, yeah, I really don't know. I mean, I, I don't know how the artists themselves would think about what they were doing. I mean, if I, if I had to guess, I'd say, well, we're just making the music that we want to make. Right. Um, and I think that's what all artists, painters, poets, you know, they're just being expressive and doing it exactly. And then, <clears throat> but it's interesting to think about where people fall. I mean, I think that's why your book is so fascinating in a way because you know you are you're really looking deep at where things come from and yeah they're made whereas when you're making it you're just doing it but you're looking into that process yeah i sort of i describe i mean one of the <laughs> one of the few parts of the book that i'm reasonably pleased with um uh is this metaphor that i've got in the introduction which is where I say that genre classification is a bit like a kaleidoscope. So you have all these kind of colored beads, all these different things. And then depending on how you turn the kaleidoscope, they regroup into a different shape and then you turn it again and the same glass beads can be grouped in a different way. So I kind of liken it to the way that critics or fans interests or predilections can restructure the whole field. So you've got all these bands, all these different identities, all these different musical ideas, and then depend, and then it's the kind of predilections of the audience and the critics that kind of reconfigure the arrangement, if that makes sense. Totally, and I don't think we should underestimate the power of those four music papers and then the face. Yeah. Criticizing yeah. at the time because it was weekly you know, a band would play and then somebody would destroy, for instance, and this is a, a interesting, uh, when hip hop, the first ever hip hop show came to London and for me, it blew me away. But the writer that I was working with on Melody Maker thought, described it as a passing fad like skateboarding. Right. So, you know, I mean, it like a criticism could destroy people's thoughts, you know, and maybe you just think, well, I'm not looking at that then, it looks like rubbish. Just, you know, in a weekly paper, Critis critics, the power of critics yeah. in, at that time was enormous and defining, you know, what was good, what was bad, what was punk, what wasn't, you know, is this a, a right-wing skinhead thing or not? I mean, it's, it's very interesting. So it's yeah. Interesting. That's the, your hip hop example is really interesting because so at the end of the book, um, and this is actually more to do with fans, this is less to do with criticism and more to do with fans. At the end of the book, I write about um, a clash in New York, and I think in about 1982, being supported by, um, I think it's, no, I think it's Grandmaster Flash. Oh, possibly, yeah. Um, and the fans, the white Clash fans, just freaking out and being like, what is this? I didn't come to see this, you know? So the Clash have this history of like, they're into reggae, they're into, you know, they've got lots of different kind of musical interests. So they do a show with early, early, early days hip hop and the audience is like, what the fuck? I just, you know, I just came to see, I just came to see the Clash. I just want to see, you know, some white rock and roll. So I think what's, you know, so setting the critics aside for a moment, I think what's interesting is that there can be competing expectations of genre. The critics have one set of ideas, the band has got another set of ideas, and then the fans themselves have got really strong investments in, um, in what they're listening to, in the way that they identify, you know. Yeah. 
yeah. Yeah, you come to see a punk band and you've got somebody spinning, DJing. Well, they didn't understand it. It's, you know, that's the thing. And especially The Clash were really into hip hop. Mm. And, so, and, and, and so was Africa, Bambata was really into punk and all sorts of genres, country, western, all sorts of things. I mean, those DJs were looking, the hip hop DJs were looking at everything all sorts of music and something that was what was mm. amazing about it mm. but yeah yeah it's really it's really great and I, I really want to read the whole book so i'm going to uh, oh actually i unfortunately have to leave right now because i've been corresponding with somebody in italy who doesn't speak very good english and he's finally sent me a zoom meeting so um but it's been a real pleasure you guys and thank you very much for inviting me yeah thanks thank you. we could talk more <laughs> but <laughs> i saw i really apologize i have to go <laughs> all right talk to you soon you guys bye thank you so much thank you everybody so um with that, we will launch a, another quick poll while I let you know how to uh, get this book, uh, What is Post-Punk by Mimi Haddon. Um, can, uh, just a kind of informal uh, survey of the room. Uh, what do you think, are these bands punk, post-punk? Uh, other is not an option, uh, although perhaps you could. Uh, yeah. Um, and if you would like uh, to order your own copy, um, you can use code umpunkva at our website, press.umich.edu for 30% off. Um, and we'll remind you that it's also uh, free to read on Fulcrum uh, through August 31st. Um, other ways you may want to pick up the book, uh, in addition to our website, if you want to support your local shop, uh, we are highlighting two uh, Mimi's local is Waterstones in Brighton we have uh, Literati in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and then once, once again, uh, if you uh, want to browse, search, uh, look at those glorious um, posters and music samples uh, up close, you can uh, read on Fulcrum for free until August 31st. Um, and I will just give another couple seconds for the poll. The, the poll's kind of deliberately a joke. I hope, I hope, <laughs> I hope the audience understands that. I don't know, maybe everyone's really invested in the categorization. Yes. Of okay. Um, okay, interesting. Uh, we're pretty split on the slits and Blondie, uh, Devo and Cabaret Voltaire, uh, less so. And with that, we will uh, wrap, wrap up. I just wanted to thank uh, Mimi Haddon uh, and Jeanette Beckman, as well as our moderator, Jeremy Clever. And I am uh, Sean Manning in sales with uh, Michigan. Um, we'll send a survey out shortly as well. Thank you all for attending. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Cheers.